Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, we're going to get going. Um, it's a pleasure to have Sumit Chopra here today. He's visiting us for three days from the Current Institute of Mathematical Sciences um, in New York University. He's uh, finishing up his PhD with Jan Lecon, and he's going to talk about energy-based models. And if you'd like to chat with him and you haven't had a chance yet, there's still a few open slots on the calendar. Just uh, approach me after the talk, and we'll set that up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. So yeah, I'll be talking about my work that uh, I've been involved in over the last three and a half, four years as part of my PhD under the supervision of uh, Professor Jan Lekyun from NYU. And uh, this is in collaboration with uh, my colleague Raya Hatzel from the Computer Science Department and a part of it with uh, our friends from uh, the Economics Department, namely Vikram Thampi, Professor Kaplan, and Professor Lehi. <coughs> So yeah, the work involves primarily two parts. The first is uh, doing learning in a relational setting. So we propose a bunch of novel algorithms that uh, can do regression in a relational setting in particular. And the second involves uh, learning a similarity metric discriminatively. <clears throat> and the underlying theme that connects the two, the two, uh, these two works is uh, the energy-based model framework, which we've applied to both the things. And Hopefully, I'll be able to convince you by the end that we can do a bunch of cool things with, uh, with such a framework. <clears throat> so just to motivate you uh, towards the two problems, in many real-world problems, what you have is uh, you cannot assume that the data is independently and identically distributed from an underlying distribution, D, that you don't know. Uh, examples include automatic fraud, fraud detection, viral marketing, collaborative filtering, web page classification, and many more, like real estate price prediction in particular. So what we have in these is samples are related to each other via complex ways. And these relationships between samples influence each other's value of the unknown variables. So for example, consider the web page classification problem. You're given a bunch of web pages and their contents, and you're asked to, and the problem is to label uh, the web page, as in uh, whether it belongs to a, like whether it's a commercial web page or a university web page, and so on. So, so consider a web page along with its contents and its label, and suppose you also know the links that this web page connects to, right? So with the, with the underlying assumption that uh, linking web pages would tend to discuss similar topics, with this link information, you can say something about the labels of these other web pages as well. Or in other words, there's a lot of information in this link structure that should be exploited, and not just uh, an IID kind of a thing. So the question is, can, can we exploit such information in addition to the individual features? <clears throat> and uh, as far as similarity metric is concerned, so suppose I give you a bunch of images, and uh, I ask you the following question. That is, give me a mapping that maps these images to a low dimensional output space, so that uh, similar images in the input space are mapped to nearby points in the output space, and dissimilar images are mapped to uh, far away uh, points in the output space. And note that the criteria of similarity and dissimilarity could be anything, as in this is something that I'll be giving you. For instance, I could say that two airplanes are similar if they differ by one azimuthal angle or one elevation angle. Or I could say that two, 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 two airplanes are similar if they have the same lighting conditions. So the bottom line is that the mapping should only be faithful to the similarity measure that I give you and should ignore all the irrelevant transformations. And the third thing that I ask for you, uh, from you is some sort of out of sample guarantee that given a new image and you don't know the relationship with respect to the training data, can you map this new image also faithfully without retraining your system again? So that's a question that uh, uh, we, I'll be answering. And so this is, uh, you can view this problem as equivalent to searching for a good feature space, whereby uh, you would end up with the similar objects clustered around the same corner, and uh, hence you can uh, do classification or regression becomes easier in that space. 
So, very briefly, as I said, the underlying uh, models are energy, like the underlying theme is an energy based model. So, just a brief introduction what they are. So, you are given, suppose, an observed variable x and an uh, uh, variable to be predicted y. What energy based model says is that you assign an energy to these two variables, E, a scalar unnormalized energy, and that sort of captures the dependencies between these samples these variables rather and this energy function can be viewed as some sort of a compatibility measure so lower energy would imply high compatibility between the two values of the variables and high energy implies low uh, compatibility so in particular in this case you are given an image of an animal which is observed and you have the set of labels y which you want to infer and your correct energy function should assign a low energy to the animal class and a high energy to all the others. And note that we don't really care about whether the energy of an airplane is higher than the car or car is higher than the airplane. So all we need to do is we need to ensure that the correct uh, energy is, is lower than all the incorrect answers. <coughs> so in France now for a new sample X would simply involve searching for a Y that uh, produces the minimum energy once you've learned such an energy function. So, and uh, as far as learning is concerned, uh, it boils down to looking for an energy function that assigns uh, low answers, uh, low energies to the correct answers and high energies to the incorrect answers according to this inference algorithm. So, what this boils down to is uh, the following. So, you have this observed variable xi and initially suppose you start with such an energy function and where you have a higher energy given to the yi, be, yi being the correct answer and low energy to some other incorrect answer yi bar which we call the most offending incorrect answer because this is like the most troublesome answer for your machine and this is like the uh, incorrect answer with the least energy and this is what exactly your machine would be producing right now as your inference. So the learning should involve pushing down on the energies of uh, the correct answer and pulling up on the energies of incorrect answer to get this sort of uh, desired energy surface. And this can be done by minimizing a loss functional with respect to the set of parameters w that define this energy function. <coughs> so yeah, so that's the broad idea behind energy based learning and details can be found in the tutorial that we recently wrote uh, on energy based uh, setting. <coughs> So yeah, coming to the first part of the talk, which involves uh, more, uh, factor graph models for doing relational regression. And uh, yeah, as I said before, samples are not assumed to be IID in uh, such a setting. Rather, they are related to each other in complex ways. Furthermore, these dependencies could either be direct, as in they could be given to you as part of the data in case of uh, the link structure of web, or it could be hidden, as in not given to you as part of the data. So now it's like a two-phase problem where first you need to infer these relationships, one, and second, use these relationships to do some form of a collective prediction. So in particular, we apply our framework for real estate price prediction problem, and uh, I'll talk about uh, in far greater detail about this problem. In fact, I'll present my framework in, um, in the light of this problem to, to, to for better for easier uh, understanding. and uh, But yeah, I'd like to say that this is a fairly general framework and can be applied to other types of data as, as well. For example, we are right now trying to extend it to the social network data for slash dots, for instance. <coughs> so yeah, of course, a lot of previous work has been done in this area more recently. But the trouble with most of these algorithms is that uh, they only cater to classification problems, as in where your outputs is discrete. And it's not straightforward to generalize them to continuous variables and, uh, and hence use them for regression. So to this end, we propose a novel framework for doing relational regression using factor graphs. And we propose efficient inference and learning algorithms for the same. And uh, uh, being in an energy-based setting, we are able to handle non-exponential family of functions as well and not necessarily log linear and uh, yeah, apply it to the problem of real estate. So. <coughs> Yeah, so the question is, how is this real estate price prediction relational? Well, 
clearly uh, my poor one bedroom one bathroom house will be much cheaper than for example chris's five bathroom five bedroom house so or in other words this uh, uh, aspect of the price is so called intrinsic price that is a function of only its individual features like bedrooms bathrooms and so on but also a one bedroom one bathroom house in a poor locality is uh, will be cheaper than a similarly sized house in a very high end locality or in other words the price also depends on the function uh, uh, is also a function of the quality or the desirability of the neighborhood in which it lies and this in turn is a function of the desirability of the other houses that make up that neighborhood and this is where the relational aspect of the price comes in and uh, the second point is you really don't know this desirability as in it's not given to you as part of the data and it's hidden and so you need to infer that as well so this is in line with the location location mantra of most realtors that uh, have been using <coughs> so uh, keeping this in mind we model the price as a product of two quantities namely its intrinsic price and the desirability of its location or thinking in terms of an energy based setting what you'll have is an energy function e1 that captures dependency of the price with the house specific features and energy function e2 that captures the dependency of price with the desirability and somehow combine the two or more formally the these relationships between uh, these variables can be uh, captured in the so called energy based factor graphs so this is like an energy based factor graph and uh, so just to give you a short uh, introduction of what an factor graph in an energy based setting would look like so you have a bunch of variables uh, for your problem some of them are observed others are unobserved and uh, you define an energy function e over all your variables now one way to do it is uh, so 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 defining a global energy function over all the variables would can result in complications as in uh, if each of your variables is very high dimensional so if you're doing an inference then you would end up searching for a very inside a very huge space like trying to search for all the possible combinations of variables however if you know something about the structure of this underlying energy function in the sense if you know that only a subset of variables interact with each other so what you could do is you could split this energy function into a sum a sum of smaller energy functions where each of them take only a subset of variables into account and uh, then the final energy is nothing but the sum of these you know, smaller functions so each of this function is called a factor that captures the dependency between uh, the variables that it takes so it's very similar to a uh, what a probabilistic factor graph would look like where you have a huge joint distribution and you're factorizing it uh, uh, with a subset of variables to make it more uh, manageable <coughs> so mm -hmm. you go back. so so this this bottom line mm -hmm. you know is this like a theorem or something that you can always represent no a it's like function as a sum no no uh, it's not really a theorem it's uh, what it says is if you know something about the structure of your energy function then you can factorize them F for example in the case of real estate price prediction we know that features of a house don't really interact directly with the desirability of the location rather they interact via the price so then you can split it into two halves i mean it's very similar to what you have in a probabilistic setting right when you know the relationship when you know the dependencies between uh, variables then uh, one way to represent it is through the entire uh, joint distribution however if you know the link structure of the variables then you can f uh, break it into a bunch of parts that is provided you know the link structure or some sort of dependencies between variables except that there we have probability theory and we know the, the, the rules that govern it and we can, we can do the fact that we can prove that the two things are equivalent. I, I probably just don't understand it because I don't know the, the underlying you know, laws that govern these energy functions. Maybe it's, maybe, maybe it's obvious. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, all you need to, uh, well, even in that case, all you need to know is what the dependencies look like, right? And then, yeah, of course, you can prove, prove it, but hey, how do you define such an energy function that uh, uh, is the sum of uh, the smaller energy functions. This is just a choice that you make, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's essentially just a choice that we make, yeah. What, what forms can the energy functions take? 
What, what constraints are there on what you can choose? No constraints. No constraints. No constraints. Sorry? No, no constraints at all? Uh, positivity. Not really. Yeah, I'm, 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 I mean, there, there are a bunch of loss functions where you don't need to have a positive energy constraint, for instance. Yeah. So yeah, so it's like a choice that we make by splitting this huge energy functions into a sum of energy functions, smaller energy functions, uh, using the prior knowledge of the problem at hand. So why are they called energies then if they don't have any? If you can choose them to be arbitrary functions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. But they can't be arbitrary because, so on the left hand side, mm -hmm. if you look at all the possible values of x, y, and z, mm -hmm. you'll get, you know, you'll, you can calculate how many values that fun different values that function can take. If it's an arbitrary function, it can take that many values. But on the right hand side, you have much fewer configurations. That equation is just a definition of the left hand side, isn't it? Yes, yes. yes. That's exactly what I'm saying. If you choose your right hand side, that's what you mean by that. Yes. So that, so that E on the left hand side can't be anything. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. So in the case of house price prediction, what we have now is a factor graph for a single house that looks something like this, that takes features, price, and desirability into account, and basically the sum of the two is your energy over all the features. But here note that this desirability of the location in turn depends on the desirability of other houses, right? Or in other words, these variables interact with other factor graphs of other houses. So more formally, this, this sort of thing is represented by uh, what we call relational factor graph, where the idea is to have a single factor graph that captures the dependencies among all the samples, all your training samples, and not just uh, have one factor graph for every house. So in particular, this is how we define a factor graph for the, relation, uh, for, for the house price prediction problem. So what for every house uh, for every house we assign a single factor e x y z this is non relational and parametric in nature and it captures the dependency between the price its individual features and this estimated desirability so that's uh, the non relational factor and uh, and this estimated desirability in turn depends on the actual desirability of the location of the training of the neighboring training samples. So f to encode this dependency, we define another factor graph and associate that with the house, EZZ. And this is a relational factor graph and non-parametric in nature. And we repeat this process for, other, for, for, for all the other houses to have this huge factor graph that captures both individual dependencies and the dependencies between the desirabilities. And as I said, now the energy over the entire set of variables is basically the sum of energy of the factors. And uh, yeah. So assuming that you've learned these, uh, so yeah, one more thing that I wanted to point out is that the way, uh, so E X Y Z, E I X Y Z are like uh, parametric factors with parameters W and they share the parameters among each other. So now for a new test house X0, the inference involves creating two new factors, building the links with its neighbors, and doing uh, the following minimization over the unknown variables D0 and Y0 with respect to that house. What are the parameters you're learning here? There's the W's and the E's. The W and uh, the Z's. And the Z's. Yeah, so they can be somewhat viewed as uh, parameters or sort of hidden variables. Yeah. I mean, we use Z's to compute this uh, YI. Uh, so yeah, so clearly for a test house, this is like an approximation because uh, uh, ideally what we would have wanted was a Z0 somewhere here that interacts with the desirabilities of the training samples. And, uh, but that would have led to minimization over the entire set of Z's over the training samples to, 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 to come up with a proper answer Y0. But, uh, to avoid such a, and that obviously is infeasible if you do that for, with respect to every training, uh, uh, every test point. So we remove that dependency with respect to Z, and of course it's an approximation, but it makes sense from the point of view of house price prediction because this data, the training data, is essentially some historic data to us. Yeah. Sorry, this 
are the parameters of these factors. So uh, yeah, so these these are basically the training data, which is some historic data to us, and the samp uh, and the test point would be some point in the future, in the distance future. So clearly, the desirability of that point might not have uh, well will not have an effect on the past past desirabilities. So that way, it makes. Uh, so, so here the dark circles are observed and the dark yes. circles are unobserved. Yes. Yes. So in particular, the training involves minimizing an energy loss E over the three sets of variables, the, 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 the unobserved variables, and uh, which is nothing but the sum of the factors. And here we have a theorem that says that if both the factors are a uh, quadratic function of d, then the second factor can be merged into the first and be treated as a function. So what you have is now the loss function, the energy loss now reduces to minimization only with respect to w's and z's, with each house having only a single factor, ei, uh, EI bar. And I'll, 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 I'll go into detail about the nature of what ei bar looks like now, well, in a moment. Uh, the learning algorithm so then can uh, is basically nothing but a generalized EM type algorithm where in the E phase you fix W and minimize with respect to Z and in the M phase you fix Z and minimize with respect to the W's. So, what was D, again? I forgot. so D was like an estimated desirability of that house from its training samples, okay. from its nearing, uh, nearby training samples. <coughs> so. M phases, uh, as I said, since it shares the parameters among the factors, it can, uh, it's, it's somewhat easier to compute and you can do it uh, using stochastic gradient descent over Ws. In the E phase, again, uh, since the two factors are merged into one and you have a single factor, we show that learning again reduces to backpropagating gradients with respect to Z. But now here note that the gradients are backpropagated over uh, a bunch of samples and not just over a single sample. Expectation make a posterior I mean, it's, it, Yeah, so it's I won't say it's like a, a proper E phase, but it's more it's more like a coordinate descent kind of a thing. It's a, it's a fixed point. Yes. Really yeah. Easy. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really uh, computing any distribution as such. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, in particular, the non-relational factor, uh, the E X Y Z is basically square difference between the log, well, we work in the log domain. So this is the square difference between the log of the predicted price and, uh, well, and uh, the actual price. So this is the predicted price, where g now is the parametric function where the w comes into play. And this m is sort of measuring the intrinsic price by taking into account only the house specific variables xh. And di is the estimated desirability from its neighbors. <clears throat> the relational factor now is again a uh, square difference between the di and this uh, uh, non-parametric function that basically takes as input the neighborhood, uh, observed neighborhood features of the house, like coming from census tract, like uh, median household income and so on, and also the z's, the learned z's of the training, neighboring training samples, and does some kernel interpolation. So, and this is how a single factor now looks like. It takes in how specific variables into G to get the log of the intrinsic price, takes in the neighborhood features and the Zs of the neighboring training samples into the non-parametric function to get the log of the desirability and sum the two to get the predicted price, uh, the log of the predicted price in the, uh, and then the, uh, and the energy is simply the square difference between the true answer and the predicted one. Or uh, to give you a little more intuition about what's happening in the non-relational, uh, in the relational factor is, so you have a bunch of training samples, each is associated with a zi, and now when a new sample comes, you compute its neighbors, and using the z's of its neighbors, you are doing uh, this uh, smooth interpolation. So what you are effectively here doing is learning this smooth desirability manifold over the entire geographic area. Yeah. So if there was a, a hard boundary like a, 
uh, a railroad track or something. Yeah, so for the moment our algorithm doesn't take that into account. It's like it essentially only takes the crow flies distance. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that, that's a part of a future work that we are working on. And not only incorporating hard boundaries, but also, for instance, right now, the number of neighbors are fixed, which we you, uh, sort of compute using cross-validation. But, uh, but for a bunch of houses, uh, how can you sort of incorporate the variable number of neighbors? So for some things, it won't be comparables, like in a condo, and then there'd be some other place, like a farm out in the middle of nowhere, there's no comparables. Uh, yeah, but for the moment, we are only working with single family residences. So that sort of removes. Have single family. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying if there's some things which are a dime a dozen, a cookie cutter, there's lots of examples of the same thing. And then there's others which is very unique. Yeah, and yeah. How can you work across the whole spectrum? Hmm. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. That the way of asking it is that the scale here is just fixed across everything. It looks very smooth. Is this the oh, no, no, no. This is not the desirability. Uh, this is not the actual manifold that we've learned. Yeah. What is this? This is just to show you that it's a manifold, that just a, just a cartoon here, basically. Oh. So, yeah. So you can handle very, because there can be very abrupt changes in price. You know, this street is particularly bad because of some of the local reasons. Yeah, so. The next bit's actually much better. Can you capture that kind of? For the moment, not. But uh, yeah, as I said, that's a, that's a part of, well, you'll see. So yeah, so now given, now that, assume that you learn this manifold, then for a new house, you have its uh, input features, uh, you have its house specific features, you plug into the G function to get the intrinsic price, you plug in the location in this manifold to get the desirability. So yeah, so learning us now reduces to a simple uh, energy loss with some regularization that uh, ensures smoothness over the manifold. And E phase now reduces, which is minimization with respect to Z, now reduces to a sparse quadratic program that uh, we saw using stochastic, gra uh, the conjugate gradient. And uh, yeah, so coming uh, to your point, well, not really your point, but uh, uh, essentially what we are doing here is uh, maximizing the conditional likelihood of uh, the, the unobserved variables given the observed variables, where the likelihood is defined as a uh, the Boltzmann distribution, with the mar which is marginalized over the hidden variables. And this is equivalent to the usual Boltzmann distribution, where energy now incorporates the, the marginalization. So this is like the free energy, if you want. And we resort to map estimation with respect to these hidden variables. So, so energy energy be positive. Uh, yeah. yeah. Here they are, yeah, yeah. But yeah, general, in a generic sense, they might not be. I mean, here it's a square distance, so yeah. So, and this is done by minimizing the negative log likelihood loss, which obviously is difficult to minimize this uh, uh, log of the partition function. So, but here we note that uh, since the energies are quadratic in Y with a fixed Hessian, this contrastive term uh, vanishes when you're computing the gradients. So, what you have is a simple energy loss along with the map estimation. <coughs> So coming to the experiments, yeah, we tried uh, the, uh, on uh, this real world data set provided to us by firstamerican.com, I think. And uh, transactions, so it included transactions from the Los Angeles County in the year 2004. And uh, since it's a real world, it's fairly diverse and spans 1754 census tracts and 28 school districts. And uh, minimal pre-processing was done, like for example, price area income variables were mapped into log domain and one of k coding uh, scheme was used for non numeric discrete variables and we used only single family residences and uh, we sort the data according to their sale dates and take the first 90% as our training set and uh, the rest 10% uh, as our test set and a bunch of house specific variables that we include were uh, usual stuff living area ear build bedrooms bathrooms and so on and the neighborhood variables came from census tract and school district information like median household income, average time to commute to work, and. Uh, SDH contains GPS coordinates as well. Uh, yes. Between the two kinds of features, because the, the I thought there was a factoring between like house specific features and then location. Yeah, 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 yeah. Specific steps. So that seems a little strange. 
No, then I think it, no, yeah, so may, maybe I'm wrong here, it does not, it does not, yeah, it does not. What kind of time window with this computer? Uh, one year? I mean, the data set was uh, spanning uh, just the one year. Okay. So we take the first 90% which was, which boils down to around 42, 43 weeks, yeah. So you used the previous sale price? Yes, yeah. that's, yeah, we use that. Did you have the date of the previous sale? Yes. yes. Okay, so, so these variables, this list isn't exactly, I mean, it, doesn't, it didn't say that, did it? It says previous sale price, but not when. Uh, what didn't say that? I don't see in this list when the previous sale was. Uh, you, you, you mean the date? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we don't use the date. Well, that's important, isn't it? Uh, I mean, if the yes. Is, is, you know, the original owner is, you know, someone lived there 50 years and died in the house, the previous sale price is going to be different than if it sold last year. Yes, I agree. Yeah, 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 we should, yeah. Actually, in fact, you uh, sort of do your sampling too? Did you say that you took the first 46 weeks as training and the next as test data? It's roughly boiled down to that, yeah. Like for, for first 90% of the houses as training. Wouldn't that be odd? You might get into a region where prices are either high or lower, might be spring, might be winter. Mm, you mean because well, of the seasonal, seasonal changes? changes? Yeah, like, I mean, if you do the other way, as in you just randomly pick, then you're not really doing prediction in that case. You'll be, like, doing a retro diction kind of a thing, right? So, yeah, I mean, I agree. The, the, uh, one uh, sort of uh, uh, drawback in this is that we only have a single year data, so you, you can't do much as in encode inflation or seasonal changes. But uh, right now, that's, again, a future work we are where we are in a process of gathering data from the past 30 years, where obviously you will be encoding uh, features like uh, time, uh, like inflation and seasonal changes, yeah. So, and yeah, you're right. I mean, previous sale price should somehow be weighted by when the thing was sold. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and a base, uh, a bunch of baseline methods that we compared to are those that have been used uh, normally in the past for this particular problem, namely nearest neighbor. You pick the k nearest training samples and average the price. Linear regression. Nearest, nearest in, which uh, in location. Oh, just physical, just just physical, physical location. Actually, Actually, we tried both, and I think location uh, does much better job than, uh, yeah. Uh, locally weighted linear regression, where you fit a local model, locally linear model over the space, which is globally nonlinear and a fully connected neural network. And what we report here is for every house, we compute the so called absolute relative forecasting error, which is the absolute error divided by the actual value. So that uh, takes into account uh, uh, if there's any outlier of uh, price. And in every column, we report the percentage of houses with less than 5% error, less than 10, less than 15, and so on. So clearly, uh, you would want these numbers to be higher, as in more houses should, be, should have less uh, percentage error. And uh, we see that we do a um, fairly better job as compared to the other algorithms. And uh, it's hybrid in the sense that it's uh, a combination of two things, both uh, the non-parametric model and uh, that computes the desirability and the parametric model. Mm -hmm. Who is using a baseline what the list price is for the sale? That is the question is how good are the appraisers? How good are the yeah, yeah, yeah. And also what models do real estate companies use? They must have models they trust. Because typically you think they might set the price high to see if they can get it. They might not get the price they actually think it'll sell for. Yeah. But, but I'd be surprised if the list price is off by 15% and 80% of the cases. Oh, yeah, well, that's, that's, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if co the companies must have, is it all local expertise or do they have models they use to make this prediction? I think it's a, well, I think it's a bit of both. But I'm not too sure about the models that they use because obviously there's no way to have access to them other than the other than these which were 
traditionally published in the literature that the, 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 that the economists have used. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, I agree. So, and here what we show is uh, the learnt desirability on the test houses. So each point is a house, uh, a test house, and it's color coded according to the value of the estim its estimated desirability. So red means high desirability, low means uh, blue means low desirability. And uh, if you're familiar with the Los Angeles area, so it's doing something really uh, reasonable. Areas like Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, here Malibu, and along the coast, and Pasadena, they're all red, indicating they're highly desirable. And uh, areas like downtown and down in the desert, they're all blue, while uh, in the valley, it's like moderately desirable. So that's something. Uh, interesting we thought was happening with respect to this model and uh, uh, another thing that we did with this was try to answer typical sellers dilemma like uh, whether making a particular modification to a house will increase its value or not and if yes then by how much so what we do is once we learn the model we perturb the value of that uh, attribute by one unit and ask the model to predict this uh, the value of the perturbed house and we also have the original predicted price and we compute this sensitivity ratio which sort of measures the expected gain in price per unit change in that attribute. <clears throat> so what we show here is a, a bedroom sensitivity manifold. Again, each point is a house and color coded according to its sensitivity. So you see that in the downtown area which is fairly congested, adding one more bedroom to the house is much more valuable than as opposed to adding another bedroom in a five five bedroom mansion in out in the desert or the, or in the valley so yeah again so we thought that something interesting was going on yeah and uh, that that ends my first part so and uh, as part of the f future work obviously one straightforward uh, extension is to include the time variable and second uh, as uh, we discussed to sort of uh, incorporate the hard boundaries and sort of have some sort of a dynamic neighborhood for every house rather than a static one. And uh, yeah, and uh, we've been uh, planning to extend this technique to other domains like, as I said, uh, slash dot data we have from uh, <coughs> in collaboration with Stern School of Business. So the idea there is uh, given a whole bunch of comments by different users and the source article you want to uh, come up with the prediction of the rating of that comment that would be given to it by by uh, different moderators. So what we model this problem is in the following way, that you have a comment whose uh, rating would depend not only on the preceding comments and the original article, but also on the so-called uh, mood of the user or, or, or his or her intellectual ability, which is hidden. As in some, some users tend to uh, generally write funny comments, some users tend to write uh, generally stupid comments or and so on. And uh, so hopefully we plan to extend this to sort of capture that uh, mood of the user. <coughs> yeah, so the second part involves learning a similarity metric discriminatively where we uh, designed a technique which we affectionately called Dr. Lim. Uh, it stands for dimensionality reduction by learning and invariant mapping. So yeah, hopefully I'll be able to convince you that this is a rather intelligent doctor. So yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, as I said, given a bunch of images, I w uh, can you generate a low dimensional mapping so that similar objects are closer to each other and dissimilar objects are further apart and also have some out of sample guarantee to this problem. Well, uh, so you might say that, okay, there, there are a whole lot of previous algorithms and you pick one and uh, provide it with the similarity and you get the answer. Okay, fair enough. So I pick my fa favorite algorithm, that's LLE. And I provide to LLE the information, explicit information that two planes are similar if they, are, if they differ by one angle, one azimuthal angle or one elevation angle. And uh, this is what I get. Uh, as output. It has completely ignored the angle or elevation information and rather clustered the points according to the the lighting conditions. 
and uh, same here. And there's absolutely, uh, I mean, it's a highly degenerate manifold that LLE constructs. So the question is, what went wrong here? The trouble with LLE and most of the other algorithms here is that they rely on a computable distance metric in the input space. In case of LLE, it's the Euclidean distance. Hence, you, you see the lighting uh, being uh, the major factor of clustering. Well, there, there are others that don't really depend on the input distance measure, but they do not generate an explicit mapping for you. So you don't have any out of sample guarantees for, uh, for uh, <coughs> such things. And uh, just to convince you that it's not, uh, these requirements are important and not really used for generating pretty pictures, because you could have certain classification or verification problems where the number of classes is very large, and the training samples per class is large, and samples have a high degree of variability among them, and you also have even un a bunch of unseen classes which you've not trained on. For example, in face verification, you'll train on a bunch of subjects, and you'll test on a bunch of subjects that you've not seen on. So you want to have that out of, out of sample guarantee. <clears throat> so yeah, just to summarize about the objective once again, we want a mapping from high dimensional space to lower dimensional space, uh, which maps similar. And the similar could similarity could be anything. So the similar samples uh, to nearby points in the output space, and the similar samples to faraway points. And uh, it should not require an arbitrary computable distance metric in the input space and hence should be invariant to irrelevant transformation. <coughs> and uh, yeah, and have some out of sample guarantee. So what we propose is a simple three-step algorithm. The first step involves building a neighborhood graph. So based on whatever similarity uh, you choose, you, uh, cre you create similar links among uh, the samples. And uh, all the other pairs of samples are considered dissimilar to each other. Step two involves choosing this function, parametric function GW, that maps uh, the high dimensional points to the low dimensional output space. And the step three involves training the parameters W so that similar points are together and far away points are, uh, uh, dissimilar points are far away. <clears throat> so the question remains what goes inside this GW and how do you train it? Uh, Pretty much anything can go inside GW. It could either be a linear function, a neural network, or a convolutional network. It it completely depends on the problem that uh, that you have at hand. For example, yeah. And as far as training is concerned, we use uh, this so-called Siemens architecture that was first explored by Bromley et al. So what it does is it keeps two identical copies of the, your parametric function GW that share the same set of weights. And you have uh, a bunch of uh, input images, like two of them, which could either be similar or dissimilar. You plug them in and generate the features in the output space. And the energy is given by any distance measure in the output space. So note that this distance measure now is in the output space rather than the input space. And uh, to, uh, to, to, to learn these weights, you minimize this contrastive loss. Or what this loss is doing is, if you have similar uh, images, then the label yi associated with these images is zero. So this part of the loss function is activated, which is nothing but a quadratic loss. So minimizing this loss is uh, equivalent to minimizing this energy function or this distance in the output space. However, if the samples are uh, Dissimilar, yi is 1, and this part of the loss function is activated, and minimizing the loss now reduces to increasing the energy or the distance in the output space. <coughs> and by some margin m here, as in because we were seeking a smooth manifold in uh, uh, a bunch of our experiments. And so you don't want to push the dissimilar samples far away apart and hence generate de uh, sort of clusters. Although we, we might need clusters in a bunch of situations, which I'll talk about. You have to level up. I think there'd be some situations where it's neither similar nor dissimilar. The plane's being rotated a little bit, but not too much. Right. I, I'm moving. I mean, similarity is a, a smooth thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're adding these links between every pair of points. Yes. Yeah, yeah so, so that's one thing that our algorithm assumes, that uh, anything that is not labeled similar is dissimilar. You, yeah, yeah. But hopefully that uh, thing 
might be taken care of by this uh, margin thing because you're not really pushing all the points uh, very far apart. So you'll be generating a smoother manifold. So hopefully you'll have, uh, yeah, although, but yeah, you're right, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's it. Uh, that's the algorithm. And uh, we tried uh, this thing on uh, the fours and nines digits from the MNIST data set. And fours and nines because they are fairly similar to each other even uh, when you see them. And hopefully we thought it will be a uh, difficult task. So we take the randomly uh, chosen 3,000 samples for training and 1,000 samples for testing. And uh, the GW was a four-layer convolutional network in our case. So, uh, and for a sanity check, the, we first computed the nearest neighbors uh, in the input space by their Euclidean distance between them. So what you get is uh, the smooth manifold that separates the fours and nines uh, reasonably well. Note that these are test samples, as in you don't know the uh, relationship between any of the two dots in this manifold, nor do you know the relationship between any of this dot with the previous training set. So yeah, and besides the separation, it has a smooth change from tilt to straight and so on. So, so your training data then, I mean your training data is labels of, of which pairs are similar. So does this mean that for all 3,000 by 3,000, you labeled all similar pairs, or are you just using the five as a proxy, where you are going in and saying that the five that are the nearest neighbors are in fact similar? Yes, yeah. only the nearest neighbors are similar. Sparse, uh, hopefully connected graph over the digits. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but I mean, that is a certain amount of. Well, I mean, like for instance, like if, if there were if there were rotated fours and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. The the automatically label labeling the neighbors in that way wouldn't wouldn't really get you those because this those neighbors are chosen by Euclidean space. Yeah, exactly. So as I said, this is just a sanity check. I'll come with the, the prior knowledge thing later on that will hopefully convince you. So now what we did was we explicitly translated the images by uh, minus 6, minus 3, plus 3, and plus 6 pixels. And again, for the purpose of sanity, we uh, check, we again computed the Euclidean neighbors. And what we get is uh, these five clusters. And uh, each of the cluster corresponds to the four translation and the center cluster, the original image. And furthermore, uh, the images within each cluster are fairly well separated. And uh, the order in which the clusters are clustered is exactly according to the way they are translated. Like this is minus 6, minus 3, 0, plus 3, and plus 6. So, it's cap uh, so 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 this is like sort of reinforcing the fact that nearest uh, neighbor in a Euclidean space might not be a good idea if you have uh, these uh, sort of complicated trans uh, translations. But there is an issue then with respect to the original premise because the, in fact you would want the fours of the plus three to be very close to the fours of the minus three if they were the same exemplar, and because that that would be real invariance, right? That you would in fact want those fours to be almost on top of each other because you would want whatever features are selected and transforms are selected from convolutional net. That's my next slide. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. So now finally, what we do is we in, we inject prior knowledge, and what we say is each sample is a neighbor of its five Euclidean neighbors. In addition, each sample is also a neighbor of its shifted versions. In addition. Uh, each sample is also a neighbor of its shifted versions of its five Euclidean neighbors. So what you have is exactly uh, what we want, a uh, uh, well-separated manifold. And if you zoom inside this, you get identical fours that, that are translated in shape, which is exactly what we wanted. So yeah, So and, and, and this is, of course, uh, using the prior knowledge. And this is what we get if you use similar prior prior knowledge for LLE, a completely degenerate solution, which uh, it's difficult to interpret what it's doing. <clears throat> Another experiment uh, was using a little more complicated data set. And uh, this was uh, uh, 
consisting of airplanes from the NORB data set and we project into to a 3D space. So airplanes were consisted of 972 images with 18 azimuthal angles and 9 elevation angles and 6 lighting conditions. And how we generate the neighborhood graph is by saying that two planes are similar if they differ by one in azimuth or in elevation. And uh, explicitly don't give any light, lighting condition uh, <coughs> requirement. And what we get is a very nice 3D cylinder. And along the rim of the cylinder, the planes are arranged according to their uh, angle. And along the height of the cylinder, the planes are arranged according to the elevation, and it ignores the lighting condition. So it's effectively returning us the way we generated our uh, data. <clears throat> and just for reference, once again, this is what LLE would have given. Uh, if, uh, and the last application for this uh, was face verification, where the task is to accept or reject the claimed identity of a person in an image. So given a pair of images, your machine would say yes or no, whether they are similar or not. <clears throat> and of course, it's a difficult problem, because you could have a very large variability in the data set. Like you could have artificial occlusions like face scarves, sunglasses, and rather animated expression. And there are a large number of classes, and there are even unseen classes uh, where uh, you've not trained on, this, on, on those subjects. <clears throat> and training was very similar, other than this loss function now. So when you have a dissimilar thing, you actually want uh, discrete clusters for every subject in the feature space. So you. Uh, so you're essentially pulling up as much, uh, pushing apart as much as possible the dissimilar pairs. That's the only difference between uh, the two. And uh, yeah, and for similar pairs, you have the usual quadratic loss. <coughs> so among various data sets, namely the AT&T, Ferret, and the Purdue, I'll just discuss the Purdue data set, which was the most challenging of all. It consists of around 136 subjects, and they have a very high degree of variability, as you can see, for every subject. And we picked 96 random subjects for training and 40 for testing. And uh, this is what we get as far as uh, the performance is concerned. For 10% false accept, you only reject 11% of, uh, of uh, the pairs. And of course, as you increase this, uh, there's an increase in the false reject rate as well, as in if you decrease this. So, but I mean, <clears throat> or to convince you a little more, what it's doing is it's correctly classifying this as a genuine pair, this as a genuine pair, which is difficult even for a human, and this as a genuine pair. And it's also able to correctly classify this as an imposter pair. And these are fairly easy. Well, this is not, maybe. So, <clears throat> Yeah, so, and there are a whole bunch of extensions to uh, this idea. And for example, you could use it to do an automatic category detection, as in uh, generating a bunch of uh, invariant features for an object. So what you have is a moving camera that takes pictures from different objects uh, at, at different angles. And, uh, and you have a connected neighborhood graph by, uh, by neighbors being defined as two images if they are temporally adjacent to each other. <clears throat> and then what you would hope to see is a cluster for every such object. So each cluster encoding this invariant features. And other techniques where it can be used beyond images is, for example, information retrieval, where you're doing semantic hashing for documents. I mean, you just need to know how the two documents, you just need to label how the two documents are similar. And, and that could be any arbitrary di di distance. And <clears throat> and natural language processing. In particular, uh, very recently, uh, people from NEC research have used this for uh, semantic role labeling. And these are like, J uh, this is the work of Jason Weston and Ronan Kolbe appearing in this year's ICML. So what they do is, uh, they train a deep architecture for doing semantic role labeling. And uh, what they, uh, in addition to the usual supervised learning of this deep architecture, for every layer, they also have this uh, uh, doctor limb training layer, which they call embedding layer. So when you backpropagate the gradients through both the supervised part and this part, you hope to get features over here that are more meaningful or more consistent 
both with respect to the supervision and also with respect to the similarity and dissimilarity issue. And they beat, pretty much beat the state of the art for semantic role labeling uh, using this technique. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so and finally I'd like to end my talk by discussing a bunch of things that I'll be interested in doing and which involves basically designing efficient inference and learning algorithms for large scale data sets, uh, primarily involving real world data sets and solving interesting questions as in obviously classification and regression are, are, are the fundamental issues but uh, can we do, can we go beyond that for instance predicting how the, in, with respect to the, na uh, the, the house prices, predicting how, da how the, na the neighborhoods change dynamically with respect to the demographic movements and such. And uh, yeah, and exploiting the underlying structure that's there in the data sets, in most real world data sets and not really use a simple IID assumption. And yeah, use energy based model, deep, deep architectures which I've been involved in as my side uh, projects and uh, probabilistic models, so yeah. And just to show you a really nice demo that myself and Raya had cell built, so these are like uh, <coughs> the images of a plane and, uh, and uh, the neighborhood relationship is again the azimuthal angle. And what you s are seeing here is after every epoch, how the doctor limb training is uh, going ahead. So the, uh, the, the, the idea is to have a circle in the end that will uh, <coughs> uh, basically arrange the planes according to their angles. So just to f fast forward it, initially everything is random. Now it's trying to solve, un unwind its loops and now it has three loops remaining. And finally it, oops. Something is stuck, I think, here. So, yeah, so finally in the end what you have is a circle and uh, as expected and then it's basically fine-tuning its parameters, the weight decay chips in and uh, the, the learning rate reduces. So what you have is uh, a circle. Yep, that's it. Thank you very much. This last stuff feels kind of reminiscent of channel equalization. Do you know about channel equalization? Mm -hmm. It's used in modems. But the idea is, I think, we all once were looking for invariant features that would work across all the variations of this. Mm -hmm. And in, in channel equalization, what you try to do is to model the noise process. I see. And then if you know the noise process and you kind of know what's going on here, you can work out the combination of the two and then you can sort of back and for what's going on. Um, I and, and I think maybe that's a sort of, you know, it's much easier to model the noise process than to find what features would be invariant across it. Hmm. So what you're doing in, in this is, is sort of giving the, the system a chance to learn the noise process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe it'd make even more sense to just model the noise process directly. And by noise here, you will be... Well, the one case you had was the shifts. Yeah. And the other case was lighting. Mm -hmm. And in general, there would be a noise process that would be dependent on the application. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In modems, it was something else. Yeah, could be here. Yeah. Thanks a lot.